the Reverend uh, Collins is downstairs. Uh, she's obviously not in the service. Her name's printed in the, wor- in the worship service. Nothing's wrong with her. She's downstairs teaching a class and, and starting uh, a new class uh, uh, this week. A uh, very interesting class. And um, if you are so inclined to go to that, I'd love to have you go to that and come to the 1030 service afterwards. But it uh, should be a very uh, fine, invigorating uh, class. And it's available, as I said, beginning this Sunday. Did you ever run out of road? That is, you were trying to find your way through unfamiliar territory, and you either hit a dead end or you ran out of blacktop. And then your GPS decides all of a sudden to stop working. Or when the weather is so bad that they had to shut down the interstate or the highway, or you discover for yourself the road's impassability. A little over 10 years ago, in an effort to reach our Colorado skiing destination, Uh, Dr. Brown and I, uh, during an epic snowstorm in the mountains at night, we got dead stuck in the middle of I-70 just before we reached the um, Eisenhower Tunnel. And with the help of a record service, we were able to put on some chains, which Dr. Brown had in the back of his truck, and we got through the tunnel, we got over the pass, and we got down to our destination. The next morning, we learned that the interstate was closed and would remain so for several days, and we had to stay longer than anticipated. That was tough duty, you know, staying longer than anticipated in the ski town. We had to ski another day in that fresh Rocky Mountain powder, doggone it. But we know that life in general produces situations when, when you and I feel that we are running out of road. It could be with work, it could be with uh, academics, it could be with uh, general relationships, it could be with family members, it could be with health, it could be with age. Whatever it is, the roads end sometimes seems to get closer and closer. Imagine Jesus, his own running out of road feelings, or running out of road feelings in the first verses of our lesson in Mark today. The passage starts out with, those who followed uh, were fearful. And then he took the 12 aside, and he began to tell them what was going to happen to him, saying, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered or handed over to the chief priests and scribes, and they will condemn him to death, and then they will hand him over to the Gentiles. They will mock him, they will spit on him, they will scourge him, they will kill him, and three days later, he will rise. Now, in our preconceived notions of Jesus' disposition, we might imagine him sharing this prediction with his disciples in a very nonplussed fashion, but we don't know that for sure. But what we do know about Jesus was that he was running out of road in this life, but understood that the road went well beyond the cross to the next life of communion with his Father in heaven. Again, Jesus was coming up against the Pharisees and the scribes, the Jewish elite of his day, who were threatened by his popularity, as we discussed before in this series of Mark, and his claim that he was the son of God, which they viewed as preposterous preposterous and blasphemous. Just in the first 10 chapters of Mark, the religious elite confronted Jesus at least eight times. And this passage this morning marks the third time that Jesus predicted his death. It's interesting and also very sad to note that Jesus in his very short ministry lived with a constant threat of death and the distraction of enemies around every corner. But consider the reaction of the disciples, James and John, to the announcement that death was right around the corner, but that he would rise again. You think that at least they would demonstrate a little sympathy for a man that they had dropped everything to follow, and that they might at least inquire of Jesus, what was this all about? rising again the third day. But instead, James and John ask Jesus to do for them whatever they asked of him. It's kind of like a friend saying to you that he or she has a terminal disease and then you immediately ask a favor of him. Where's the sympathy? Where's the empathy? Where's the concern? Well, at least with James and John, there wasn't any pretense for concern about Jesus' future, 
just a grab for influence and power with the request, grant that we may sit one on your right hand and one on your left hand. All this will be, of course, in your glory. You don't know what you're asking, Jesus said. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink? Are you able to be baptized with the baptism with which I'm going to be baptized? In other words, James and John, I sense here more self-centeredness than I sense selflessness. Let's go back again to Jesus' road quickly coming to an end. What particularly distinguishes this passage is the last several words of this ominous prediction. Three days later, he will rise again. Now, as I mentioned before, there are some occasions where one feels that he or she has reached the end of the road. But it is precisely that time when one needs to reach for strength and the might and the resolve that our Lord provides. This is a great theme of the Christian faith, my friends, hope. Jesus is about to experience the worst imaginable death, the cross, but in the same breath, he says, I'm going to rise again. You know, as Paul said, O death, where is thy victory? O death, where is thy sin? So it is a question that we ask ourselves in times of great stress and in times of great need. For once do we gather our strength and sometimes even our purpose when we feel we are running out of road. President Lincoln, in his second annual message to Congress in the thick of the Civil War, said, The occasion is piled high with difficulty, and we must rise with the occasion. As our case is new, so must we think anew and act anew. You know, the situation is different, of course, but the spirit is the same. When we sense that we're running out of road, we have to think anew many times and not rely on the old ways of handling things, handling the challenge or handling the crisis. This is when we rely on the virtues and the values of the Christian faith. But we know too that it is easier said than done with the uncertainty and the unpredictability of family issues or of economic challenges or relationships that disappoint or vocational discouragement, sickness and health or just a general state of life. We don't always know, my friends, where we're going to end up, which makes an even greater case for the anchors and the foundations of faith. And it is our challenge to not go through life intimidated by the times that we are running out of road. We are to get the best out of life and to not allow life to get the best of us. Similar to what Jesus is talking about, his impending death at the hands of merciless soldiers, but in the same swoop declaring himself to be risen on the third day. It's important for us to understand, understand too, that we are not always able to figure things out or to fix the things that trouble us. We're not always able to help those in need of help or understand those who are in need of understanding. As Jesus was unable to turn around the attitudes of all the people who disliked him, or to stop the irresistible terror that awaited him. Understanding this, Jesus, what did he do? He let go of it, realizing that there were fixed dispositions and temperaments that he couldn't fix. I don't think Jesus necessarily thought he was running out of road in these relationships. He just realized that one can't always arrive at the destination for which one had hoped and prayed. But you still move on, knowing that nothing has the power to separate you and me from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord, as Paul said. Norman McLean, the Presbyterian pastor in his well-known book, River Runs Through It, later made into, as many of you know, a well-made, a well-known movie, reflects on his uh, own relationship with his own brother who was on a downward spiral with gambling and drinking. 
It's a true story. And he didn't know where to turn or what to do until he finally said, each one of us here today, well, at one time in our lives, we will look upon a loved one in need. And we were asked the question, we are willing to help, Lord, but what, if anything, is needed? For it is true, we can seldom help those, in many cases, who are closest to us. Either we don't know what part of ourselves to give, or more often than not, the part that we have to give is not wanted. And so it is with those we live with and should know who elude us. But we still love them. We love completely without complete understanding. When we feel we have run out of road with a loved one, we know we still love them completely without, as he said, complete understanding. And we always pray, we always pray that the love of God will place someone or some event in their path to enlighten and to encourage them. As the psalmist said, a lamp for his feet, a light unto his path. Much of our lives come down to our belief, you see, in the love of God. When Jesus ran out of road, this is what it boiled down to for him. I will be crucified. I will die a torturous death. But on the third day, I will rise. He knew God's love would save him in the end. When you sense you're running out of road, remember that if you arrive at the point where you feel there's nothing left to do, God's love will help you rise again and again. It's always the unshakable and unwavering virtues of the values of the Christian faith, always, that pull you and me through. Remember Mark Jansen mentioned to me last week the remarks given by NBA Oklahoma City Thunder assistant coach uh, Monty Williams at his wife's funeral last week. <clears throat> Her car was hit by a reckless driver whose car spun out of control and, and hitting uh, Ingrid Williams head on, killing both her and the driver of the car. Now, it would be natural to feel as if you're running out of road at the time of a sudden, unexpected, tragic loss of the spouse. But in this case, it was different. Coach Williams, a deeply committed Christian, married to his wife for 20 years, five children who listened to their father give a deeply moving and powerful eulogy at his wife's funeral, which included these words, God loves us, God is love. And when we walk away from this place, let's celebrate. We didn't lose her. When you lose something, you can't find it. I know exactly where my wife is. I'll miss holding her hand. I will miss talking with my wife. Then the coach asked the audience, to pray for the family of the woman responsible for the accident. He said, everybody is praying for me and my family, and that is right. But let us not forget that there were two people in this situation, and that family needs prayer as well. That family didn't wake up wanting to hurt my wife. Life is hard, life is very hard. And we as a group, brothers united in unity, should be praying for that family because they grieve as well. Now, just consider the powerful witness and influence of those words for everybody who heard them. One NBA player said about the testimony, that was probably one of the most powerful moments, sitting there and listening to him, to have the strength to stand there in front of his own children and ask everybody to pray for the other lady who was driving the other car. It was strength and courage that I have never experienced. When you have faith and forgiveness and Christian hope, you never come to the end of the road. You never run out of road. 
no matter the hand that you are dealt, no matter the problems that you face, because as Paul said, I can do all things. I can do all things. I can do everything through Christ, which strengthens me. Amen.